Okay, hello everyone. We would like to start this uh, symposium. And one of the great things about the society is all the younger people that are here that will carry on the great traditions of our field. And in this symposium, we like to recognize and honor some of our outstanding new investigators. And so we have two of those talks today, which I'm sure are gonna be a real treat. And the way it's gonna work is each of the speakers will have 35 minutes to present their results and ideas. And then we have 10 minutes to ask questions. Uh, so I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Luca Biasco, to come up here. And I would like to present him with this little token of our appreciation and uh, have him then give his talk, which will be on clonal tracking of genetically engineered hematopoietic cells and human cells. Thank you, everyone. And first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the SGCT committee for the award and for the opportunity and honor to join a community of great scientists that were recipients of this recognition uh, before me and that made a great contribution to the field of gene therapy. So today I'll uh, talk about our work on current tracking on gene genetically engineered hematopoietic cells in humans. And this work uh, has been conducted in the context of ex vivo gene therapy for primary immunodeficiencies, where patients receive autogous infusion of hematopoietic cells that are uh, gene corrected with a retroviral or antiviral vector, and then they are infused back into the patient. And thanks to the use of integrating vector, uh, this approach was among the first clinically that have um, substantial success in the early days, but this came together with uh, the risk and actually uh, reports of adverse events related to the use of integrating vectors and insertion of mutagenesis. So as you know, these early reports sparked uh, a new era of investigation related to integration site analysis. And here I'm listing just a few of the many great contributions in this area that uh, were regarding both the technology for integration site retrieval but also the uh, biology of viral vectors in preclinical and clinical context. And uh, pretty much when I joined the gene therapy community in 2005, this was a big deal. And it's still, it's still some kind of deal. And uh, indeed, every clinical trials that involves ex vivo gene therapy with the use of integrating vector now has to commit for a safety follow-up, which encompasses not only the classical laboratory test, but uh, integrates them uh, with uh, the analysis of integration sites. And the integration of the information actually are able to lead to a clinical decision in, uh, in these patients. So this is the area where I worked on since I started, uh, since I joined uh, Gene Therapy in 2005 in Milan, and uh, is based uh, on uh, the actual retrieval of integration site, which is done uh, through a uh, two-step phase. Whatever system you want to use, uh, now there are different systems. In this example is the classical standard LLM PCR, but there are other methods out there. But essentially, they all require a fragmentation of the genome and an enrichment of vector genome junctions. So the junction where you have a fragment of the end of the vector and the neighboring gene. So this fraction can then be amplified and run on a gel so that you can have a first look at the clonal repertoire of your sample. Then you are able to pull these amplicons in a library go through high throughput sequencing and analyze the integration sites and retrospectively map these genomic fragments in the, or, uh, the map of the host genome. So with the advent of high throughput sequencing, integration site analysis start, could be then used as coronavirus barcodes in gene therapy patients. And this because uh, we were able to retrieve uh, a much higher number of integration from the same sample as was done before, as compared to what was done before with the 
standard Sanger sequencing and uh, with, with a, a much reduced cost. And the use of, back, of integration site as clonal barcodes is based on the concept that each uh, cells that uh, gets transduced and infused back in, into the patient is univocally, univocally marked by an individual integration site that can be then tracked in the, the progeny of the cells. And uh, so if you are able to isolate difference and population from the patient, correct the integration site, sequence this integration site, you are able to identify two uh, main information regarding the clonal composition of your sample. So you have a clone ID, which is essentially the insertion locus, and uh, you can add also the name of the single causes gene to the integration site, and a surrogate measure, measurement of the abundance of this clone. This can be achieved by sequence read count, by uh, random barcodes, by sharing sites, there are a lot of metal out there, is a surrogate, uh, marker, but uh, it still gives you an idea of how abundant is your clone in your original sample. And then you can combine these two information to perform longitudinal tracking uh, of these clones in vivo, and uh, you, you can use integration site sharing uh, to try to reconstruct somehow the, um, the map and uh, the relationship between the uh, population that you are analyzing. So what we did uh, in the past, I would say seven, eight years, is uh, we committed uh, to fine tune uh, the workflow that was originally designed for safety and to make uh, this uh, uh, suitable for performing clonal tracking studies. So we have to work on the um, integration cell retrieval and analysis of integration profile and on the isolation of uh, specific samples from our patients. And, uh, this was not an easy task because when we started this work, uh, we realized we were in an uncharted territory. So uh, clonal tracking studies have been performed in uh, preclinical uh, models, in uh, mouse models, in uh, human primates. But in humans, it's another story. First of all, you have to deal with the source material. The scarcity of the samples and the purity of the samples are a big deal. You sometimes have to work with leftovers and uh, you have to deal with the sampling issue. So you're working on, uh, on a few of ml of blood out of an entire human organism. And the vector perturbation, not necessarily in insertion of mutagenesis, but uh, uh, benign perturbation of the vector due to the fact that you are using a therapeutic transgene. Obviously in humans, you cannot use a GFP. So you have to deal with the fact that the therapeutic uh, transgene somehow can have uh, an effect uh, on your data. And regarding the data, uh, there, there, there was and there is no gold standard for the analysis, for the graphical representation of the data, for the interpretation of the results. So we had to deal uh, with uh, all these aspects uh, and uh, we worked uh, hard, um, I would say, in the past years to try to address as best as we could all these different, different uh, um, constraints. And uh, luckily, we were able to um, surface uh, relevant information regarding uh, uh, hematopoietic cells uh, by clonal tracking in uh, different gene therapy patients that were treated at TIGET in Milan. And uh, during the, this uh, next minutes, I'm going to go through each of these uh, works to show what were our main findings. So when we decided to start with uh, clonal tracking studies uh, uh, with integration side, we decided to start working with a more confined setting. So we decided that, that uh, T cell, tracking of T cell subtypes was uh, a good uh, uh, start to test if the integration site analysis can be suitable for this type of studies. And uh, luckily we had in hand uh, a very interesting clinical model of uh, early gene therapy for ADA skid where patients received uh, in uh, the mid-late 90s, peripheral blood mature T cells that were uh, gene corrected with the retroviral vector. So it's important to those notice that this patient received only mature T cells, and so there is no gene corrected hematopoietic progenitors in these cells. So we, we figured that this was the best model to track the survival of T cells in humans, and this by analyzing the integration sites many years after the last infusion that these patients received. 
But the first finding that when we decided to sort the different T-cell separation in naive central memory, effector memory, tumor cells, and we analyzed the presence of the vector there, we found that there were vector positive naive T-cells in these patients even 10 years after last infusion. And if you think about it, it doesn't make much sense if you think that naive T-cells should be short-term living. So, and there is no progenitors in these patients that is keeping producing T-cells. So we let this information sit for a while. We thought about classical technical issues, maybe contamination, etc. We were pretty confident, but uh, you never know. It's, uh, it's part of the, of the game that you might have some finding that just cannot explain and maybe, maybe is a technical artifact. But then this paper came out in 2011 showing that inside the, the, what we define as a phenotypically naive population, you can distinguish another population called T memory stem cells that has the precursor capability of a naive T cells but a survival of a memory cell. And all of a sudden, we had some uh, uh, markers uh, which we were able, like CD95, that allowed us to identify if uh, uh, how, and how many CD95 positive cells were in our original naive uh, T cell population. And uh, what we found is that uh, essentially all of what we previously thought they were naive T cells were instead T memory stem cells. So we were now in a system in which these uh, newly defined T cell subpopulation could be tracked in vivo humans. So we committed to, to, to track this population. We analyzed integration sites from the different subtypes, T memory stem cell central memory and effect on memory from PBL gene therapy, and we compared them with the gene therapy trial for the same disease that where patients have received hematopoietic stem cells, and where obviously you have vector positive naive T cells because you have progenitors there that are gene corrected. And in this work, we start to see that you can use integration site sharing to somehow reconstruct the um, hierarchical position of the cells in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, um, mature cells that generate, in terms of precursor cells that generate more mature cells. So we identify a certain group of integration sites that were shared among these lineages, but the sharing was not random. As you can see, in the PBI gene therapy, the uh, population was sharing the highest number of integration were T memory stem cells, while in the stem cell gene therapy, they were the naive T cells. And actually, the sharing was going down in a pretty nice linear differentiation to, from naive to, t, t, central memory, to uh, T memory stem cell to central memory and to effect of memory, which we found was very much in line with the model of linear differentiation that was proposed by several groups at the time. So integration site sharing could be used as surrogate marker of precursor activity. And we could also track individual clones over time. So what you see here is heat uh, map, maps showing individual clones in each row and the color code represents the relative clonal abundance. And then you have uh, detection of this clone at se six or eight or seven or 12 years after the last infusion. And we were able to detect uh, clones that maintain the T memory stem cell phenotype at seven and 12 years after the last infusion, but they were also generating central memory and effector memory cells. So this was a proof of the survival of this uh, population long term. So the self renewal capability of this population, but also their precursor activity. So in this work, uh, we show that the T-memory stem cells are able to persist and to preserve their precursor potential in humans for up to 12 years after infusion. We got this nice cover, and I'm not showing you this uh, to brag about it, but just to show that uh, it represents a turtle with a radar on his uh, back. And um, this uh, is because for the, our kernel tracking studies, we are using a lot of statistical tools that are used in ecology to track the fate of animals. So we were very happy that they decided to refer to this in their cover. So having uh, shown that uh, the potential of integration site analysis for coronal tracking, we decided to expand to a more complex system, the entire hematopoietic system. And we worked on the hematopoietic, uh, on tracking the hematopoietic uh, constitution in a Wiscotodic syndrome a gene therapy treated patient, patient that received autologous infusion of CD34 positive cells transduced with an antiviral vector carrying the WOS gene. 
And uh, this was um, considering that it's still a disease setting, but it was a pretty ideal setting where to study uh, hematopoietic constitution in humans because of the robust gene transfer uh, that we achieved on uh, infused C34 positive cells, because of the fact that there was a persistent multilineage engraftment, and uh, because also the fact that the vector did not uh, generate any clonal aberrant proliferation. So it was, a, a, let's say, a pretty physiological uh, system where to study uh, the dynamics of hematopoietic reconstitution. And the first work was most, mostly aimed at studying the safety and efficacy of this trial. And here you can see a comparison of common insertion site of lentiviral vector that we used as compared to a gamma retroviral vector, vector that has been used in the same disease setting, but uh, that was associated with the development of a lot of severe adverse events uh, related to integration into the MECOM LMO2, LMO2 genes. So we could clearly show that our approach was safer, but in the same context we showed, we started to use integration site sharing to show efficacy of, uh, of the try of uh, our um, therapy, and um, we could track a certain gr group of integration sites that were shared between myeloid and lymphoid lineages, but also with the bone marrow CD34 positive cells. And this is a, a crucial point. From these patients, we not only had access to samples from peripheral blood after gene therapy, but we had access to several bone marrow aspirates after gene therapy. So we could compare in real time what was going on in the bone marrow with w what was uh, present in the periphery as mature cells. And we could also track the sharing of integration site from CD34 cells with the other lineages. And we saw that the, there was an initial phase in which the sharing seems to be a little lower and then there is uh, um, actually higher uh, sharing later on and we could track uh, some clones uh, over time. And so one of the initial findings of this work, which wasn't, wasn't focused specifically on clonal tracking, is that uh, we got some hint of the fact that hematopoietic constitutions occur in waves, and that there might be different waves of uh, clonal output by CD34 positive cells. So these results were promising, therefore we committed to study the entire hematopoietic reconstitution by analyzing more specifically individual lineages composing the entire blood system and their progenitor in the bone marrow. And to do so, we had to commit for a high level of purity of samples. So we essentially, uh, through magnetic beads purification, uh, achieved an average purity of 94%, and we also used fax sorting and the data from the colonies. And we started scanning the hematopoietic reconstitution from these individuals and different time points. I'm just showing you these slides, which represent few of the many samples that we have to analyze per each time point, per each patient. And just to show you that it was a great effort and a great team effort. And uh, this led us to track, uh, to be able to track almost 90,000 clones from seven, seven peripheral blood and six bone marrow lineages over time, including bone marrow CD34 positive cells. Mm -hmm. So this gave us a data set in which we could start all the cross comparison and all the analysis in more in details as compared to before. So the first question we asked is, can we look at the uh, diversity of the repertoire of our uh, genetically engineered cells? The diversity is an index that takes into account the number of integration sites and the uh, clonal size. So the higher it is the number of integration sites and the more even is the clonal distribution between the clones, the higher it is the diversity index. So in this plot, you can clearly see that after an initial phase, we saw a stabilization to a high level that was maintained in all patients over time. And this plot encompasses all the data of the peripheral blood together. But since we had the different lineages, we could analyze the diversity for each lineage and as you can see from this plot, this initial phase showed something like a first wave of diversity and then gone exhausted and then a takeover of uh, uh, cells that showed instead a higher diversity which was stable over time. 
So we found again a queue of existence of, of, uh, existence of two waves. And then we ask ourselves, are the clones that are active in this initial phase the same clones that are active later on? To do so, we can track individual, individual clones over time. These are top five clones over time from one patient in the bone marrow and the peripheral blood. Each row is an individual clone. And as you can see, the clones that were detected at one and three months after gene therapy were poorly or not detected later on. What happened at six months is that instead we start to find another group of clones that start instead to be recaptured consistently over time and over the years. And these clones were actually not detected earlier on. So not only a difference in clonal diversity, but also a difference in clonal composition. And uh, this, again, was testifying uh, the existence of different waves of reconstitution. And next question is, can we uh, measure the output of the CD34 positive cells by analyzing the integration site sharing and understand if the output of the, these progenitors is also different in these two different phases? And we, as I said, sometimes we have to come up with some fancy graphical representation, and I found this was pretty telling, and so I decided that to put forward this way of representing a CD34 output. And I want you to focus on this rainbow part, which represents the shared integration site from CD34 cells. The bigger it is, this part, as compared to the red part, the higher it is, the output, and the more colored it is, the more diverse it is the output, in, in, the, in the sense that the output goes towards many different lineages. So let's now have a look at how these patients behave in the, uh, during, uh, uh, after gene therapy during uh, reconstitution. So in the first months, we can have different levels of output, but every time each patient show a shrink of this output at the third month after gene therapy. So you can see, for example, if you follow patient three, you can clearly see that this output shrink. What happened is that uh, after six months, we observed that there was a recovery of the output, which was then maintained to a very stable and very multi-lineage level over time. Again, another indication of waves. This wave is also uh, affected by different output of C34 cells. So these and other data were put together to come up with, uh, to come up with uh, this model of hematopoietic reconstitution, where we have a bigger population at the beginning, but uh, a lower multilineage output. And then we have a, a switch to what is a steady state hematopoiesis at around six, 12 months after gene therapy with a takeover of long-term HSPC. So we were uh, preparing the man manuscript, we were ready for submission, and uh, um, obviously this uh, was new information. We didn't know if we were right. And what happens is that this uh, paper came out in the meanwhile from the you know, non-human primates. And for once, we were less worried of being scooped, but more happy to find that we actually were having a good confirmation of the fact that uh, other groups were observing the same behavior. So we became pretty confident about our data. And so in this work, we could show different things, uh, repopulating waves. We could also, I didn't have time to show, uh, we could estimate population size and dynamics during the, the early and late post-transplant phase. So now we know that there are these two different phases. Uh, the point is that uh, in the work that I show you, um, we consider the CD34 population as a whole. But you know that this population is composed by different subtypes with different potentials. And um, therefore, we decided to commit to increase the resolution of our analysis and to focus on the tracking uh, of uh, this uh, subpopulation in humans and uh, to understand uh, in our model which HSPC subtypes are in charge of uh, the different phases of the reconstitution. And to do so, we had to combine two different uh, analyses, a phenotypic characterization of the bone marrow uh, which co encompasses the definition of the different uh, subpopulation, both the primitive 
sa population hematopoietic stem cells, multipotent progenitors, and multi lymphoid progenitors, and the more committed cells, pre-BNK, CMPs, GMPs, and megacarioerythroid progenitors. So we had bone marrow aspirate after transplant, and it was the first time that we could look inside the CD34 population of a patient after receiving transplantation and see how the different um, subpopulation composed the CD34 compartment. And we combined then this information with our molecular tracking system. Do we see waves also in the composition of the CD34 positive cells? The answer is yes. In the first phase, you can see that there is a peak of committed progenitors, and makes sense. There is a high demand for production of uh, different uh, uh, lineages after conditioning of the patients, after transplantation, and in particular, CMPs and GMPs were the more active, but we saw also a boost of pre bnk and then a stabilization later on. What was surprising is that this was also present in the more primitive compartment. So if we can think that it makes sense that there is a peak for MLPs because there is a demand for T-cell reconstitution, we were also observing a peak of multipotent progenitors in this initial phase. And I want you to compare this with the red line, which is the HCs that instead did not peak at all. They were stable over time. And uh, this led us to think that not only there is a wave, but this wave is uh, maintained by a different composition of C34 compartment. So the first thing we wanted to check if uh, we had to factor in any effect of selective advantage. So I remind you we work in the WASC gene therapy trial and context, which means that there is a selective advantage for gene-corrected lymphocyte because this is a primary immunodeficiency affecting mostly B and T cells. So we observed over um, the years, and also here we confirm that there is a selective advantage for vector, copy, uh, vector positive cells in the B cells and late T cells differentiation. But there is no effect at the level of the progenitors. So the progenitors have a very comparable vector copy number. This was uh, relieving for us because we didn't have to factor in, in our analysis the effect of uh, selective advantage. And it actually makes sense with the, the biology of this disease. So having uh, checked this, we committed to analyzing integration site. As I said, we increased the resolution. We analyzed the progenitors. Uh, inside the C34 compartment, then uh, bone marrow lineage positive cells and peripheral blood lineage positive cells. In six patients, after, uh, up to five years after gene therapy, and uh, we uh, collected uh, around 150,000 individual integration sites with marking clones. So as I said, we wanted to check who is in charge of the hematopoiesis in the different phases. We had to come up with an um, analysis that takes into account the integration site sharing between all these lineages and try to re reconstruct the hierarchy. And we generated these networks of con conditional probabilities, which in simple words is a, a network that asks this question. If I observe an integration site in a given lineage, what is the probability that I observe the same integration site in a progenitor upstream this lineage? And uh, it does these analyses at once on multiple lineages. And we could apply these uh, analyses to data that are collected in the first 12 months after gene therapy. And we came up with this uh, sharing of integration site between the lineages. You see there are some spurious connections. It's not perfect. But you can see that there, is, uh, there are weaker connections among the lineages. We are still waiting for the establishment of a stable hematopoiesis. Uh, what was interesting is that we found a very active uh, MPP population that was producing both myeloid and lymphoid precursors in these early phases, much more active than the HSCs. What happened instead when we analyzed the late phase, in the late phase, HSC were clearly in charge of the maintenance of the hematopoietic system and of the production of both myeloid and lymphoid cells. And um, this is not an obvious finding if you think that a couple of years ago uh, the, the, there was a paper on nature that sparked a debate 
on uh, what is the real role of HSCs and MPPs in maintaining native hematopoiesis. But since these analyses are done up to five years after gene therapy, we're pretty confident that we are in a system where hematopoiesis is stable and not influenced anymore by the transplantation. So we can tell now that HSCs are the one on top of the hierarchy. I want also to point your attention to the MLPs. The MLPs were not connected with HSCs. They were seems to be independent, and I will come back to this in a few slides. So what we found is that we could uh, measure the output of MPPs and HSCs for the first time in vivo in humans, and we could track the lymphoid and the myeloid output, and we could see that if we isolate clones uh, from MPPs and HSCs that were specifically detected early in the early time points, so you can clearly see that there is a different in, difference in output between MPPs and HSCs. HSCs, they have a, a lower output, as you can see here from the dotted line, which is much closer to the, to the axis. And then it becomes, these cells become instead, uh, these cells become instead much more active later on. And MPPs instead were active earlier, and they, these MPPs, uh, some of these clones were active also later. But the question was, uh, since we saw these uh, different uh, phases of HSC behavior in the same clones, can we uh, track a group of clones that uh, after transplant underwent quiescence and then get reactivated uh, uh, later on at uh, what we think is the 12 months switching to the steady state? And the answer was yes. We could identify in HSCs clones that were not active in the early phase, as you can see here, but they got clearly activated later on. And this was the first proof of the fact that the HSC clones that are taken out of dormancy, in vitro manipulated, infused back into the patients, they can home. And once in the niche, they can go back to quiescence and reactivate it only at a specific time window. So this was pretty amazing. Question is, can MPPs do the same? And the answer is no. No MPPs clone that wasn't active. We essentially, all the MPPs clone that were not active in these early phases, they were never able to kick in and become active later on. And this is a crucial difference between HSCs and MPPs. And again, um, I think apps resolving the debate about the role of these two populations. Then I, I was mentioning about the MLPs and the fact that these progenitors were somehow disconnected from the HSCs. We decided to use the myelolympho skewing to measure progenitor survival on the basis of this assumption. The HSCs have a balanced production. They produce myeloid and lymphoid cells. So if there is a cell that is short-term surviving and is very dependent from the production of the HSC, this cell should uh, let's say, inherit the same signature, a balanced repertoire. And this was the case for the multipotent progenitors, regardless of the fact that the, the, the group of integration were in detected or not detected also in HSCs, they were balanced because they are dependent from a continuous supply from HSC. And this was true also for myeloid committed progenitors. They are dependent from a continuous supply from HSCs and so they have a balanced integration cell distribution. So we thought, okay, maybe all the progenitors, all the committed progenitors, they will have a balanced repertoire. But this was not true for MLPs and PreBNK. Their distribution, their output was clearly lymphoid skewed. So that was telling us that at least a group of clones inside this population were able to survive for a short or long, for a mid-long period of time in absence of uh, HSC, HSC supply maintaining a lymphoid skewing because MLPs did not inherit the balanced repertoire of the HSCs. So we uh, hypothesized here yeah, for the first time that MLPs in vivo humans are capable of a longer uh, survival in absence of uh, not necessarily uh, actually dependent on an HSC supply. And this information regarding uh, info skewing was very much in line with the fact that MLPs uh, clones were independent from the HSCs. 
And there are other, uh, we're working on this uh, with a group uh, of UCI with Adrian Trusher in London. There are other groups that are reporting uh, that even when you use in gene therapy patients a myoid engraftment, you maintain uh, lymphoid engraftment for a longer period of time. And uh, this is not only due to the survival of lymphoid cells, we think, but it's also due to the uh, maintenance of uh, upstream uh, uh, a group of upstream uh, lymphoid committed progenitors. So this was a pretty new findings and we are uh, aiming now at investigating this in more de detail. And uh, we use this information and other information that I didn't have time to show you uh, now and I'm getting to the conclusion now regarding uh, um, the hematopoietic reconstitution that we could refine our model and uh, I hope you're going to see the, these results published soon. We are now under second revision, so uh, I, you, you will be able then to go through the details of this. And in this work, we essentially showed that multipotent progenitors and hematopoietic stem cells population have distinct roles during the initial reconstitution and steady state. And um, we are suggesting that the early, early lymphoid progenitors are capable of independent long-term survival. So I hope in conclusion that I convinced you that uh, integration site analysis is a relevant tool to uh, surface uh, um, biological significant information directly in, in, by the tracking of clones in vivo in humans. And um, our data on T cells can be easily translated to CAR T gene therapy context and our data on hematopoietic uh, stem cell reconstitution, we think can instruct future approaches of both gene therapy and transplantation. And with that, I would like, uh, obviously this is a huge teamwork. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Alessandro Yuti, which was uh, my mentor when I was a PhD student and then became my co-PI in these works. And a uh, very talented group of people at TIGET, uh, in particular Serena, Luca, and Francesca that worked uh, with me uh, for many years on these, uh, on these projects. And uh, collaboration with the group of Eugenio Montini, with Luigi Naldini, and uh, with the uh, all clinical staff. Uh, and uh, we, I also benefit from uh, counseling uh, and collaboration with uh, other groups. Uh, uh, outside uh, uh, Milan, uh, and not only on the tracking uh, uh, studies, but also in general on the safety of uh, uh, gene therapy and integration site analysis. And now I moved my activity and my research work where I opened my lab in uh, Boston, uh, the Boston Children's Hospital, Dana Faber Cancer Institute uh, uh, gene therapy program. And uh, uh, I also have uh, uh, collaboration uh, with the group of uh, Adrian Trasher and uh, UCL. And, uh, we're and we are here continuing uh, these uh, works and other works in the, com in the context of uh, uh, human hematopoiesis. And with that, I would like to thank you and thanks again the committee for the award and I welcome any question. Okay, very good. We have three microphones, one in the middle and one on each side. So please go to those microphones with your questions. I'd like to ask you, um, since you have the sequences of 150,000 different in, uh, insertion sites, did you make any observations about the specificity of integration? You mean in terms of uh, neighboring gene, uh, in yes. terms of... Uh, so overall, uh, we observe that there is no skewing whatsoever towards uh, specific oncogenes. So the profile that we published uh, in the safety work was maintained over time up to five years. We haven't digged into the differences between uh, the different lineages. We don't uh, have clues of uh, clonal... Um, aberrances in the lymphoid compartment, for example, but as for the, the for example, the specific uh, HSPC subtypes, the integration are an, in a number that is not comparable to the one uh, of the mature lineages, so it's difficult to extrapolate this kind of information in a statistically consistent way. But so far, we don't have any, any clues of uh, any selection occurring uh, in, uh, in our patient. Okay. 
if there's no further questions, let's thank Luca again. Good.